Hello and welcome to the extended version of my CMMC Day 2024 presentation on security control inheritance and requirements traceability. If you don't know who I am, I'm Jeff Baldwin. I'm the founder and CEO of Space Coast Cybersecurity, a CMMC provisional instructor, certified CMMC professional, and certified CMMC assessor. So I actually train for those certifications and I also am a consultant in the ecosystem helping organizations prepare for CMMC assessments and AR 171 assessments under DIBCAC High. And then lastly, uh, I also do join C3PO assessments under the Joint Surveillance Voluntary Assessment. So hitting it from three directions, from trainer, assessor, and implementer. Now, when we go into my talk, this was the abstract from that, it's all about looking at where your requirements apply. So you have requirements for your system. We have identified those as being AR-171 for covered contractor information systems. Uh, now that requirement's been applied to the system. We can take that and look at system components that make up that system. And then we can see whether those requirements apply to each of those different system components. Now looking at that, we can get a visualization of where those requirements apply and then we can also identify external service providers in the CMC ecosystem where you may be inheriting controls. And then when you're inheriting controls, it can either be a common control, which means it's fully inherited, or a hybrid control where it's partially inherited and there's some aspect of shared responsibility. So by doing this exercise, you'll get a lot of visualization that will help you with your security design and, and then ultimately your security architecture when you identify how each and one of those requirements are going to be met by each of your system components. So there's going to be a key theme around requirements. So it's basically I am force feeding some systems engineering concepts. So there's a lot of different people in IT and cybersecurity have a variety of backgrounds on how they became into the cybersecurity field. Um, but a basic underlying understanding of systems engineering is going to be very helpful because one of the things is when we look at the NIST guidance, a lot of that guidance has been created by systems engineers, system security engineers, uh, CEDAs, security systems engineering, technical assistant contractors. So there's been a variety of involvement. Um, so when you get this background, you'll start to recognize why they do some certain certain things like when you have a requirement that is overloaded it's basically a compound requirement so then you get into things like we're going to break that requirement into several assessment objectives with determination statements and then those determination statements now it becomes more of a requirement that's less compound so you can start seeing some elements like that so getting a baseline general understanding of systems engineering is very helpful when you are designing and building your systems for compliance with cmmc and other frameworks and this framework, this particular process and all this does work in other frameworks. Like if you are doing risk management framework, I've done these concepts there and now I'm just adopting them in CMMC. So what we're going to talk about today is some background information. So if all of what I was just talking about sounded foreign to you, we're going to go through some of the core concepts so that when we have the discussion later, a little bit more of it makes sense. We're going to have a discussion on internal versus external, what it, what it actually is, security control inheritance, and some taxonomy around different providers, matrices, and then we're going to finish up with the process of how you can create requirements, traceability matrix, uh, and then what an example one might look like, and some of my takeaways. So one of the things that I'll point out is there will be a slide with all the definitions. Now there's two exceptions with that. For the most part, all the definitions that I use are from the NIST glossary. So they're all NIST definitions. All those links are available to you. There are a couple definitions that I had to make up because the NIST glossary didn't quite hit what I needed to. Uh, and then there's one that's from project management. So it's not from a NIST resource. So that those that'll be identified. So some of the same, this is the, the first background information that you're going to need is understand that you have an information system, right? And that information system is basically a collection of those resources that are going to do some performance activity with the information. So 
In this framework, we're talking about federal contract information. We're talking about controlled unclassified information. That is the information that's going to be referenced by the information system. So those things that you collect together, that you have a network diagram, that you put a red box around and say everything inside this box is my system, that is what we are talking about here. Um, now those components that make up an information system, those are system components. Those are your building blocks. It could be hardware, software, firmware, uh, and some methodologies too, it could be people. So you can actually identify people, assets as part of your system. And then here is two of those concepts from systems engineering. The first one being verification, which is basically saying, hey, did I build the build it, did I build it right? So you've defined some sort of performance standard, you have a design spec. Now we're just gonna verify, did you build it correctly to your design spec? Now the validation piece goes hand in hand with that. Verification and validation typically are said together. Uh, validation's a little bit different. It's basically answering the question, did I build the right thing? So if you view all of the requirements from whatever framework, whether it's AR-171 or another framework, if you're viewing those as requirements where they are a desired system outcome that's being achieved. So you could build something correctly to your standard, and then you can look and say, does this actually achieve the desired outcome? And if it doesn't achieve the desired outcome, you're actually not passing validation at the point. So then you'd have to redesign it to an extent. So those are two concepts that are useful to understand. And then the next slide is on the definitions from internal versus external. So the inter there is no definition for an internal information system. This is the same definition from information system. So it's kind of implied if it's talking about information system, it's going to be your information system. Uh, external information systems or components are things that are outside of your authorization boundary. And you may not know what an authorization boundary is. Uh, um, so that's why that next definition is there which is the components to be authorized for authorization within authorizing official, excludes separately authorized systems. So in CMMC terminology, um, this is what's, your accreditation boundary is what's covered by your CMMC certification. So if you're connecting to other separately authorized systems, those separately authorized systems are going to have their own CMMC certifications, or they're gonna be FedRAMP equivalent or FedRAMP moderate if they're a cloud system. Now the other thing that is defined in external information systems is what an organization is. So NIST describes a lot of organizations and they can be any size complexity you're positioning. So the entire organization could be everything. The It could be a department, it could be a division, it could be however you want to structure it. So you have a lot of flexibility in there. So what that means is you could actually have one legal entity or one company that has more than one defined organization within it. So then you could have, all right, here over here is my defense business unit, and that is its own organization. Over here is my civilian organization, and they actually are separately managed, et cetera. If there's going to be the same management, the same con um controls the same people responsible for managing each, then typically you would combine those into one system, but you can carve out systems however you want to. This is one of the art forms. There's not really a science to this. It's what works for each um, individual corporation and organization, how they want to structure what an organization is. Tying this back into CMMC as well, a little bit further, uh, we have the organizational scoping with HQ units. We have the host unit, which is the thing that's going to get the CMMC certification. And then you have your supporting organizations. So understanding this concept of internal, external, how you're carving things out, what's, what is your system, what are external systems that can help when we're designing these things. Now, if we incorporate into what is security control inheritance, that is the basically when you're writing an SSP and you're describing in your control narratives how you're meeting a particular control if you start describing other systems then the other system 
is how you're talking about how it's being satisfied. So it's being satisfied by something other than your particular system, right? You can identify those things. You can also do it um, internally, right? So if I'm operating at a control level, right, and I've identified a common control service provider, and we'll get into that in a second, um, but if we have something that's providing that service to me, that could actually be another system component within my same system. Whatever that thing that's providing it to me could exist outside of my organization and it might become an external service provider. So it can be any number of ways, but the key thing is there's something that is providing security functionality for me, right? And the three in this uh, terminology with when we're talking about security control inheritance there's three types there's the common controls which I mentioned as being something that is fully satisfied so if I take a particular control and I say this thing is a common control that means that whatever that provider of that control they're fully taking care of it for me you might want some you know validation piece verification validation piece to say yes yeah, that's actually the case that they actually are providing for me what they're saying that's probably a good idea and from a hybrid perspective though um, that is where this partial inheritance where you have the security functionality you have the security requirement you're getting part of the functionality from another source but it's not all of it so typically where you might see this is like in an a where you have a determination statement alpha which talks about something has been defined typically you as the organization as the host unit have to define what that's defined as and then for b that's usually the performance objective which is you're performing and align with the uh, definition of whatever requirement you just defined in a so there might be a split there where um, from a racy chart perspective with the responsibility accountability consulted informed one thing I always say is that you cannot delegate accountability, but you can delegate responsibility. So you might have delegated some responsibility, but some of those accountability governance pieces, you typically cannot uh, delegate those away. So from my experience, most controls end up in a hybrid state um, where most people think you're going to be able to fully, fully inherit things. But when you get down to the assessment objectives, then it starts to fall apart and most things actually end up being hybrid controls through my past experiences. And then the third type is the system specific, which is you as that system, you're not inheriting it from anywhere else, you're fully responsible for uh, implementing the requirement. Now, I've mentioned some of these already, uh, but here's just the taxonomy of different providers. So these are all government definitions from those different sources, but we have an external service provider, which is NIST, which is kind of the umbrella term, uh, not NIST, but the CMMC term. This is actually a CMMC term versus a NIST term. This one is actually um, that umbrella that talks about things underneath. This is actually from the CMMC proposed 32 CFR rule. So that's where this definition came from. So yeah, it's mentioning security protection data. So we'll see if the final rule keeps that in there or if there's modifications. These other two are, are also definitions provided from the government. So an ESP um, could be a CSP, an ESP could be an MSP, it could be an MSSP. I just didn't provide that one with the managed security service provider. But basically you have these different types of providers. Uh, all that to say that there's another provider type a common control provider. So in the other examples, um, it's kind of like the organization, whereas the common control provider, for whatever reason, in this definition, def, def, this definition is it's an organizational official. So who's that official responsible for those common controls? So this is where I just kind of diverged from the NIST glossary and said, you know what, I'm gonna assert the word service. So common control service provider versus common control provider, which is an organizational official. So what is the service provider that's providing the service? And then what actually is the service? So common control service, common control service provider. Fairly straightforward there. Now you could extend this into hybrid, hybrid, hybrid control service provider, hybrid control service, but I didn't feel the need to do that. I already made one definition. I didn't feel like making more. 
So I think uh, the common control service provider would encapsulate hybrid controls under there as well. Now there's a variety of different matrices. The first one, a traceability matrix, this is actually out of 800-160 volume one. That's basically the recording relationships between two or more products. This is talking about software and design, for example. That's an EG, for example. Um, the other ones you might be familiar with, depending on other frames, frameworks you've worked in, is a security requirements traceability matrix or maybe a security control traceability matrix. It's all kind of describing the same sort of stuff. And then just for fun, I have pulled this one from projectmanagement.com, I believe, where it is the requirement traceability matrix. Uh, that gets into more of the project and project work. So that may not actually be the, the most accurate. Maybe the better term would have been CMMC SRTM versus RTM. Um, but really what we're getting down to is that there's a variety of different types of matrices. It's just sort of a mapping and showing relationships. Now, if we were to create a CMMC RTM or SRTM, probably a little bit more accurate, um, we would be, you know, the first step to doing that is to figure out what is what are your system components? What are, what are the things that make up my system? And then what is the logical grouping of similar assets that are handled in the same way? Um, so that's an example here is when you're coming up with that, you can have it as a logical grouping. It, you can be more granular or less granular. Uh, the more granular you are, then you have more requirements and uh, verifications that you have to perform. Um, if you are too generic and not granular enough, then you get it back into that concept of gr uh, compound requirement where to prove that out, you have more steps to prove it out versus kind of more of a one-to-one -one where statement plus assessment plus verification, validation. Um, but the example I gave here is if you only have one type of server, just use servers. If you have multiple types of servers and you're handling them in different ways, like Windows servers, Linux servers, Unix servers, however you want to do it, not really a right or wrong way to do it. It's whatever makes sense for your organization. So that's one of the accesses is the actual assets that you have. And then the other access, access, -y, access would be um, the assessment objectives. So mapping to AOs instead of controls, very important because your AOs or the assessment objectives are going to be um, different between implementations. So you wouldn't be able to cleanly map it. You'd miss a lot of granularity doing that. So that's why I say, Take your components, map them against assessment objectives. And then and then when you're within that mapping, um, at the first level, you can identify whether it's common, hybrid, or system specific. Now for the slide, I chose this one, which I've made some modifications, but this was just giving you an example. So if I picked one particular control, you can see we have the assessment objectives, five assessment objectives on the left, and then going horizontally, we've identified, uh, we've broken it out into CY assets, security protection assets, contract or risk managed assets, just to kind of give you a visualization. You can determine whether this thing applies. I have users, the facility, documentation, and we know from CMMC scoping, we have people, technology, and facilities. So everything to the right of facility would be the technology. Everything to the left is either a facility or people. Uh, there's a bonus one of documentation. But essentially this is saying, um, we have a requirement to perform vulnerability scanning. Do we do vulnerability scanning on documents? No. Do we scan users? No. Do we scan facilities? No. But with these other things, we do scan them. Here we have identified where there's some common controls here. First row being we have an risk assessment policy that addresses where it's been defined. Uh, second one, second bunch is, is that we have a uh, vulnerability assessment service, whether that service is something that is external or something internal to your system, whether you're doing something on-prem or in your own cloud environment that's part of your tenant, or is it some other service that you're using? Um, so this is just not real data per se. This is just giving you a demonstration. Um, I should have included like hybrid and system specific examples. 
Uh, the other thing that I like to do when I have this view is that I like to typically hyperlink to the evidence. So if I'm looking at this and I would say, where's my RA policy? I'll have a link to be able to click on it and, and evidence uh, inventory essentially. And that's helpful. And the other thing you can do is like, if I want to look at my Windows server and you have a filter on there and you can say, show me all the common for Windows server. And then you say, okay, great. And then show me the hybrid, show me the system specific. And then you know, okay, for these systems specific, there's no nothing that's providing any functionality for me. So it's entirely my responsibility to get that implemented. So it helps you with some of your planning, some of your visualization to be able to view it like this. And another good example would be if you had like an enterprise service system. So at, at my particular organization, let's say I have this enterprise system that provides a lot of functionality. Maybe that's where I have my SIM and it's self-contained within my organization, right? And then I'm going to maybe build some enclaves off of that. And then those enclaves might be separate systems. So I can have that as two separate SSPs. And then in my SSPs, I can describe that there is a connection between the two systems. I can describe how I'm inheriting controls from this other system if I want to handle them separately. If I want to have, you know, from a business unit structure, you know, I have this division, they're going to be responsible for their own stuff, but I'm going to provide some enterprise uh, security functionality for them as kind of like a, a, a cost center to, you know, centralized management costs so that each of my separate systems don't have to do that. So that's kind of for those more large and complex environments that might do that. For your smaller, smaller systems, you may not have any of this. So when I take, get out of the PowerPoint, I'm going to open up a different visual that it looks more like to me what the typical cloud environment might look like. Uh, before we get to that though, um, I do have some of my takeaways. So some of the takeaways from the presentation is that the best way to unlock NIST guidance is to think from the perspective of a systems engineer. Remember a lot of the authors of those things were systems engineers or system security engineers. The other thing to think about from that is that NIST is intentionally flexible. So they don't tell you how to implement anything. They just tell you what you're supposed to achieve. And however you're able to achieve it, perfectly acceptable. So there's a lot of flexibility in the requirements not telling you how to do things. The other takeaway is that recognizing that you have information systems and you have system components. And the system components make up an information system and you have the requirements go flow, flowing to my system through a 7012 clause, potentially, right? I get my 7012 clause says you're going to implement AR171 for protecting CUI. Perfect. Now I look at those requirements and I look at my system components, figure out which of those requirements they should apply to. And then applicability can be reassessed through continuous monitoring. So that's saying I made this determination, this was not applicable. I made this determination, this was common, this was hybrid, this was system specific. Continuous monitoring is reevaluating those controls over time, seeing if that applicability has changed. Now, if you have functioning change control processes, there's a security impact analysis that would know that the control is being affected. Um, so you shouldn't find changes there. You should find your changes between assessments uh, through your change control process. But absent that operating as it should, you'd be able to identify it when you're doing a reanalysis of those applicability statements. And then how do you satisfy those requirements? from different design elements, from inheritance, that's system design. And if something else is providing that requirement, satisfying it for you, you can common, you can make that fully inherited or common control or partially inherited through hybrid control. Now, those concepts of common control, hybrid controls aren't typically described or discussed in CMMC, uh, but this is in the NIST universe, and this is just borrowing from other NIST standards that describe security requirements and security uh, control inheritance. So uh, the other thing mentioned is that security responsibility matrix. So if you are working with another source, which is a common control service provider that's providing you some service, 
then you would have a shared responsibility matrix where you, both parties are agreeing to what's being provided. The most common thing that I run into is, you know, you'll have maybe a business area, business unit having their system, and then there's the enterprise system, and you go talk to the business unit and they say, you know what, I'm inheriting that from the corporate system. And you go, great. And you go over to the corporate system and you say, are you providing this to that business unit? And they're like, absolutely not. I don't know what they're talking about. So there's, this takes away your assumptions. The, there's no longer assumptions in what's being provided. This is specifically saying what's provided, what is the shared responsibility. And then once you build this out, it gives you that system-wide coverage of the requirements. So I talked about how you can view it specific to each component to see which ones, how they're being implemented uh, from an inheritance perspective. Well, you can also look at the horizontal access and look at that control and see how it's being addressed across the system. And then I'll provide these slides with the recording, uh, but here's a lot of the, the references there and then the last slide. So, like I mentioned, I wanted to bring forward this, which is, you know, the same sort of thing here with the different requirements, practices, looks a little bit different because I don't know where that file went. So I kind of recreated it a little bit. What I thought would be a little bit better than the way I did it before is identifying internal access assets and then external assets. And then from a color coding perspective, the purple is just representing CUI assets, green is representing contract or risk managed assets, orange would be specialized assets, and then blue being security protection assets. So in this particular example, this would be a mostly cloud environment. You might bring in your laptops, you might have your GCC high, you may or may not have mobile devices, whether you want to scope that in or scope it out, and you might have removable media in terms of disk, paper, uh, I mean, any, any types of physical media, essentially. Now, if you do start having physical media, then a lot of the physical controls will come into play, whereas if you're fully cloud, a lot of assessments end up being mostly virtual without too much evaluation of the physical controls. Uh, we'll see how that plays out over time. Printer, if you're going to print CUI, that would turn purple. If you're not going to print CUI, you're just say, hey, we're not printing CUI. Uh, we have policies around, don't print CUI. And then if you had government property or operational technology, which might be like your manufacturing floor, uh, you can still look at how these things could meet these things, right? So with specialized assets, these may not be able to implement the requirements, but we can identify and perform that analysis and document the analysis. So these are not applicable, as you can describe. This can't be met because of performance requirements because this needs to work in a particular way. We can't put the screensaver on this, um, you know, manufacturing job because we'll be in the middle of a job and then the screensaver comes on and disrupts the job. You know, valid business reasons. Or I have a restricted information system that has to have field parity with a fielded system from the government and I have a contractual requirement for it to be Windows XP, right? So things where you can't necessarily do the security you might want to do you can at least capture that here as well, and that's giving you your visualization. Because we also know from the scoping guides is that you're going to inventory all of your asset types, which include these other ones. And then this also, like I said, gives you that visualization of which of those ones are actually going to be applied and implemented, and then which ones are not. So it gives you good visibility that way. All right, and then there's one last resource that I'm gonna point you to which does a more complicated version as the CMMC Center of Awesomeness. And they have their spreadsheet here, which gives you a template to start from. So you see mine a little bit shorter. This will be a little bit more um, verbose, I guess, not verbose, but more more complete. So you wouldn't take this unless you had all your things in there. I'm gonna have to enable editing here. They give you this warning that says basically, hey, we got, you know, first best guess at it, but maybe you want to do a little bit better with that. Uh, and then they have the applicability here. 
So this is what I was referring to. They have different assets here, life forms being people, objects, assets, and then in scope applicable controls, uh, in scope non CMMC controls. So you can define other things and gives you a much larger uh, requirement traceability matrix. So if you're going from a starter point and you're like, hey, I got a server, it's a COI asset. Uh, we have these things here, depends, basic. So we can look at, does this apply to my particular asset type, my system component? And then you can see for the most part, there's not asset or system components that would implement every single requirement other than maybe the, the documentation because you're documenting basically everything. But aside from the documentation, you can see there's quite a bit of not applicables. Again, this is, as the note said, you know, these are just generic, customize it for your environment. So this is a good place to start if you're starting this exercise because then you can say, okay, which one of these things do I have? What's the starting position? Okay, it does apply to me. Then you can do that next step of identifying is this common hybrid or system specific. Now, if you do that, it'll give you a very good starting point so you're not starting from scratch because I know that's probably one of the questions will be, hey, do you have a template? Can I have your template? Um, that's on my back burner of listing things to do, but this is a good starting point because when you work and you have a particular you know, setup of, hey, I just have a laptop and I got GCCI and that's it, that's my system. The, those types of systems, they're not gonna look very different from each other. Uh, it just it depends on what uh, external service providers you might have. So who might you be using for your SIM functionality? Who might you be using for vulnerability scanning? That may vary between different organizations, but from a mapping perspective, um, it's going to be pretty common. So I hope you enjoyed my presentation uh, on security control inheritance and requirements traceability. And the better you're able to do this, the more prepared you will be for assessment. So if you have gone and went through all of your different asset types and your system components, and you identified how each one of those ones are meeting requirements or you know inheriting or not inheriting, and then you have the evidence for each block here. So if somebody was to assess you on your laptops, you would already have a list of Here's all of where my evidence is located for this particular one. I've generated an artifact. We can go look at that artifact. This is the one that's system specific. Uh, and then you have the ones that are, this is common, fully inherited, and what, what is providing that to you. So you can identify the source of that inheritance. And then you should have an applicable shared responsibility matrix where that service provider is also indicating that they actually provide it to you. And that'll give you two side verification and validation that that requirement is being implemented. So if you do have questions about this, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, depending on my availability, I may make more uh, on this particular topic, but the goal here was to introduce you to this concept. And from here, it gets into customization. So there's no real one size fits all. It's always gonna be organization specific and meeting the needs that you have there. But if you do go through this exercise of identifying all your components, identifying how you're meeting requirements, then that's going to be the number one thing you can do to prepare yourself for CMMC assessment. Hope you enjoy the presentation and have a good rest of your day. Thanks.